Hey everyone, good evening. It's nice to see everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, it's hard to believe it's been a busy semester uh, here at the Armenian Studies Program and we're winding down the semester and as we prepare for uh, a, a brief Thanksgiving uh, Day holiday coming up in the next week or two, we do have uh, an event this evening which I'll talk about shortly and introduce our guest speaker. And uh, also want to remind you of another event, our last event of the semester, which will take place this Saturday. It'll be on Zoom. And the event is called In Front of the Eyes of the World, the Memoirs of Setrak uh, Tumurian. And uh, there are a, a group of uh, um, editors and translators who took uh, Setrak uh, uh, Turumian's uh, memoirs and translated into uh, English. And uh, those are Vahe Tashjan, uh, Yashar uh, Tolja Jora, uh, uh, Barlo Dermagardichian, uh, Murat uh, Chankara, and Maggie Mangasarian uh, Goshin. Uh, a little bit about uh, Setrak uh, Timurian. Uh, he uh, put together his memoir, his life. He lived uh, between 1860 and 1930. Uh, he was from uh, Gesaria. Uh, he lived in Istanbul, and there's also a Fresno connection, and we do have uh, these books available uh, for sale afterwards, uh, including his uh, sojourns in, in uh, Europe, London, and his short stays in New York. He travels to Constantinople, um, later to the United States, chronicling his life as a carpet merchant. So. Uh, we welcome you all to uh, sign up via Zoom. You can find the flyer on Facebook, Armenian Studies Program. You can also go to our website, uh, Fresno State Armenian Studies Program, and uh, get the link for the registration for Zoom because you will need that. And once you uh, register, you'll receive uh, a, a link for the, for the Zoom. So a little bit about uh, tonight, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our guest speaker, who's really not a guest speaker, he's a familiar face to our program. Uh, Barlo Dermagardichian is the Barbarian Coordinator of the Armenian Studies Program and Director of the Center for Armenian Studies here at Fresno State. He began teaching an Armenian Studies Program at California State University, Fresno in 1985. Uh, and he has taught courses in the Armenian language, uh, history, literature, culture, art tonight, uh, church, and a variety of other topics on Armenia and Armenians for the past 39 years. Dermagurdichan was named in 2008 as the editor of the Armenian series at the press at California State University, Fresno. Armenian titled books in a variety of disciplines will be published in the series. The Armenian series of the press under the general editorship of Dermagurdichan has published 20 volumes, and specifically the one for this Saturday was done through the uh, California State University Press. Dermagurdichan was the recipient of the Aurora Mardiganyan Medal bestowed by the Armenian Genocide Museum in 2023. So if you recall at the beginning of the semester, our very first event was about Aurora Mardiganyan and her life as she sort of escaped the genocide and, and made it to the United States. Uh, in addition, His Holiness Karekin II, Catholicos and Supreme Patriarch of all Armenians of the Armenian Apostolic Church, uh, bestowed upon Dermagurdichian, as well as the St. Nerses Shinorali, or Graceful in English, medal and encyclical uh, for his service uh, within the Armenian Apostolic Church. Uh, he is a seven-time president of the Society of Armenian Studies, and has led uh, 10 uh, study abroad trips to Armenia. And if I just may say for just a moment, uh, Barlow has been a mentor of mine. Um, as many of you know, my name is Hago Kohannes and I, I teach in the, in the program. Um, I was once his former student. Um, I visited Armenia uh, for the very first time with Barlo Dermagurdich and a few weeks ago we had many of our students who were on that trip uh, talk about their reflection. So it's, it's an honor uh, to work with Barlow and we're looking forward to your talk. Barla there, Magradicha. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure always to uh, be here and to be able to speak to you. 
Uh, first of all, I'd like to just mention again about the Armenian series that uh, Dr. Oanesian uh, mentioned that tonight you'll see as you're going out, we have a table set up uh, with uh, 19 of those books. Uh, there's no other Armenian series press in the United States that's published as much as we have in the past uh, probably 15 years or so. And actually just today I received a new book that we will be, we will be putting on sale uh, very shortly. It's a masterpiece work on Armenian music called Western Armenian Music from Asia Minor to the United States by uh, Hachik Hazarian, uh, one of the premier clarinetists, and many of you have seen him perform uh, here in Fresno with the Keptime Bands. Uh, that book will be for sale as well. I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Ronesian. Uh, this is his 10th year here at Fresno State teaching, so let's have a round of applause for him. That is quite an achievement, 10 years uh, here at Fresno State, and he's been uh, an integral part of our program, teaching in Armenian Studies, uh, teaching courses in Armenian Studies 10, which is the intro course, and Masterpieces of Armenian Culture. Tonight, we're going to uh, take a look at uh, Armenian art, and especially the early Armenian tradition. Now, go ahead, hog up and hit number three. Let's see if that goes to what I want to do. Yes, I think that's perfect. Finally, I got the lights after so many weeks uh, figured out here at, uh, at Fresno State. So we're going to start, uh, first of all, by acknowledging uh, the people that sponsored uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, the sponsor is the Grace and Paul Shahinian Armenian Christian Art Series. Uh, this is the parents of Mr. Dean Shahinian. Dean Shahinian lives in uh, Virginia and has become a close friend of our Armenian Studies program. And he has uh, pretty much done a lot all over the United States in supporting the teaching of Armenian art. And he has just inaugurated a new uh, chair or visiting professorship at St. Nerses Seminary in New York for the teaching of Armenian art. So we're very thankful to him. He's providing a grant uh, to the Armenian Studies program for, uh, for this. Uh, it's not something I'm getting paid for, but it's for our program. So uh, we're very thankful for him. So tonight, uh, we're going to start uh, with the basics which is that uh, you cannot have a manuscript, which is by definition a handwritten document. You cannot have an Armenian manuscript without having the Armenian alphabet. So the Armenian alphabet was created uh, some 1,600 years ago now, in the year 406, and it's attributed to the priest, uh, St. Mesro Mashtots. Here's a look at the Armenian alphabet. Uh, this is what is used in Armenian manuscript production. 36 original letters, that's these up here. Two letters were added in the 12th century when Armenia came into contact with foreign, uh, foreign visitors, and these would be the Crusaders. The Crusaders came from Europe, traveling to Jerusalem to recapture Jerusalem for Christianity, and in the midst of that travel, they traveled through the Armenian kingdom of Cilicia. And there, the Armenians then adopted letters of the alphabet to bring in foreign words into, into the Armenian language. Uh, you can also see that the Armenian alphabet, in its order, I, Ben, Kim, depending on the dialect that you use, follows pretty much the Greek order of the alphabet, because the Armenian alphabet, in its order of letters, pretty much follows the Greek alphabet, although the Armenian alphabet has 36 letters, whereas Greek only has uh, 22 letters. And uh, so we go back to the period of the Armenian alphabet and say, well, what was it that was a primary mover? Why did the Armenians decide in the 5th century to create an alphabet? Why didn't they do that in the 1st century? Why didn't they do that 1,000 years before? And the answer is it's tied in with Christianity. And the answer, one of the answers, or one of the reasons that's given for the creation of the Armenian alphabet was as a way to instill more deeply the Christian faith in the Armenian people. So just imagine we go back 1,600 years and we're in a, a, a service. We're on a Sunday and we're at a church service in Armenia. Well, in a church service, you're going to read passages from the Bible, aren't you? Well, the passages had to be read in their original languages. Greek for the New Testament and either Hebrew or Syriac for the Old Testament, which meant that, which meant that the reading had to be read in the original language, and then someone had to stand next to that person and translate it into Armenian so that the congregation could understand what was being said. And so therefore, one of the reasons for the creation of the alphabet 
was to promote and instill, as I said, uh, Christianity. There's other reasons too and other interpretations. Uh, but also it took almost 30 years for the Bible to be completely translated into the Armenian language. 30 years of effort on behalf of uh, the early Armenian writers and authors. Uh, also, I present to you today the cover of the first printed Armenian Bible. Uh, printing is a topic that maybe I'll cover in another uh, talk, because tonight it's about handwritten documents. But here you see the cover of the very first printed, complete Armenian Bible in the year 1666. And it was published not in Armenia. Why not in Armenia? Because in 1666, Armenia was uh, pretty much under foreign rule. Uh, and so it was actually priests living in Amsterdam who published the very first Armenian Bible. So tonight our topic is going to be the early tradition of Armenian manuscript painting. And tonight I will be using some alternative terms. So I'd like to use also the term Armenian manuscript illumination. Illumination because Jesus brought the light to the world. Christianity is bringing the light to the world. And so by illuminating, by painting the manuscripts, you're also bringing that Christianity to the people. It's also called Armenian miniature painting, which is a little more descriptive. You could probably all figure out what that means because it's painting which is done in smaller size to fit the size of manuscripts. Anywhere from the size of maybe uh, two inches to an entire folio or page. And tonight we'll take a look at uh, the, those uh, manuscripts. So a little bit first about uh, Armenian manuscripts. So I'm just going to give you an overview of what we have in the world about Armenian manuscripts. Today, uh, it's estimated that there are uh, over 25,000 Armenian manuscripts existing in the world. This could probably only be a fraction of the total number that were ever produced. These are the ones that have survived. I'll use the word survive because these are living things, right? Manuscripts are, are the living works of the Armenian people. Tonight's presentation is about illustrated or painted manuscripts, and we believe today there are about 10,000 painted manuscripts that contain illuminations. So 15,000 are just texts, gospels or other texts, but 10,000 of them have a variety of paintings that we'll look at uh, this evening. Uh, the other question is, why don't we know that, right? Why, why don't we know uh, all about the, the manuscripts? Because all of them have not yet been cataloged. So tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about cataloging, too. Um, and, and a little bit more about the early tradition. And the first, the first statement is kind of very interesting. It says, only 14 partial or incomplete illustrated manuscripts exist from the 9th to the 10th centuries. So our entire, when I say our, the entire Armenian literary tradition before the 10th century is only encompassed in 14 manuscripts. We do not have any 5th century Armenian manuscripts. And just a few minutes ago, I, I mentioned to you that there's an alphabet, right, in the 5th century? We had Armenian original historians, Agatangelos, Horenazi, and others. Where are their original works? We don't have them. There are no Armenian manuscripts from the 5th century, the 6th century, the 7th century, the 8th century. Only 14 from the 9th to the 10th century and most of them are what we call Gospels. So tonight, uh, the focus of my presentation on Armenian early art will be on the art of the Gospel, the painting of the Gospels. Uh, that's the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now you can imagine that's not going to change much from Gospel to Gospel, right? The manuscript has the text. It's the painting that we're going to be interested in uh, this evening. And actually, if you look at uh, the history of Armenian manuscript illumination, and comparing it to that of the Byzantines, uh, the Armenian tradition is almost overwhelmingly Christian. So almost all works that are illuminated in the Armenian tradition are Christian works. If you look at the Byzantines, they used also secular works, right? Things that are not Christian related. Uh, a little bit more on the, uh, uh, on the illustrations. Uh, pretty much what I uh, mentioned to you again, that uh, pretty much there are just, just a few manuscripts left. If you look at uh, point three, so ninth to 10th, 14 manuscripts. Imagine, just 14 manuscripts have survived. But when you move to the 10th century and 11th century, we have 22 uh, manuscripts. And as you move forward in time, there are more and more uh, manuscripts. So the number of manuscripts 
increases as we get closer to, to our time. Um, and this source for this is a, a good article if you're interested in reading about what I'm talking about uh, by Professor Qiyum Jin, our former professor here at Armenian Studies, who was a specialist in Armenian art history. Um, and his article is The Evolution of Armenian Gospel Illumination. So the information here uh, comes from that. So the other point I want to introduce tonight is where do you find a manuscript? Where do you go to go see a manuscript? Uh, have any of you, or how many of you have actually seen an Armenian manuscript from before the 18th century? Okay, a few hands have gone up, good. How about before the 12th century? A few of you have been to the Matenataran probably to yes. be able to see it. So let's take a look at these uh, manuscript repositories. The largest collection of Armenian manuscripts in the world is in the Mesrop Mashtots Matenadaran. Maten Adaran in Armenian literally means place of manuscripts. It was established in 1957, which is in the Soviet period. And what, what happened is that the manuscripts that were in different churches and different collections were brought together in one place to ensure their safety, but also to be able to start cataloging them on a professional basis. So today, it's uh, estimated that there are more than 12,000 Armenian manuscripts in the Matenadara. Of course, not all of them are illustrated, but that's the largest single collection of manuscripts in the world. Now, before the advent of what? Computers and scanning? You had to actually go to Armenia if you wanted to see a manuscript, but today you can uh, see manuscripts online. And I want to talk to you about what's called in Armenian, uh, the word up here, it says, my tsutsak, my mother, tsutsak catalog. And I want to show you uh, the way Armenians have been cataloging the manuscripts, because that's a really important part of studying the manuscripts. The Mandana Tehran, as I said, began compiling a brief list of its manuscripts in the 1960s and published two volumes of the, uh, of the brief list. The brief list is just is just like the name, the title, maybe something about the date, and just a brief, brief list. That's not a complete catalog. However, in 1965 and in 1970, they began publishing uh, the official cataloging of the manuscripts. And today that's called My Tsutsak. It's online. They have 12 volumes, excuse me, 10 volumes of the My Tsutsak online, where you can go and it downloads a PDF and it gives you the list of the manuscripts. So I want to show you one just to, to take a look at it. But take a look at what's left to be done. Uh, it's going to take 40 volumes to be able to catalog all of the manuscripts, but they've only reached 10. So there's a little bit of work to, to be done, but I want to show you what it looks like. Uh, well, it's kind of hard to read, isn't it? But this is all Armenian. This is the printed page of the Maiv Sutsav. And I specifically chose this manuscript. Can you see the number? So that's its catalog number. It's catalog manuscript number 2374 in the Matenataran collection. And tonight we're going to look at that manuscript because it's called the Etchmiadzin Gospel. And it's the earliest gospel book that we're going to look at uh, with its painting. And so what it gives you is uh, the information, the size. They measure it, give you the size. Then they give you a very detailed description of what is encompassed within it including if it has illustrations, they give you a list of the illustrations that are there. So imagine you're doing the cataloging. It's a very painstaking job, is it not? You have to one by one go through that catalog, to go through that manuscript to be able to, uh, to do that. Um, and then it also gives you some of the examples of the writing style, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So pretty interesting, isn't it? This is from the Mayr Tsutsag of the Armenian Matenataran, uh, of which there are 10 volumes published online. You can go to matenataranam.am and you can, you can see it. If you ever go to Armenia, uh, you can go to what's called the exhibition hall and see the uh, exhibit of some of the manuscripts, many of the manuscripts. Fortunately, because I've had a long relationship visiting Armenia, when I took a group of students last summer, we were actually able to enter into the vaults where the manuscripts are kept. They are kept in secure vaults, in uh, steel vaults, that keep the humidity and the temperature constant because you want to protect the manuscripts from any kind of damage. 
So this is a real interesting backstory to the Matena Taran from, from my perspective. That's the largest collector. Then the second, oh, this is the exhibit hall. Again, uh, many of you have been into this uh, place. You would see many of the, of the uh, manuscripts, including the world's largest Armenian manuscript. As big as my arms are wide. The story of the manuscript from Mush, which was cut in half, given to two sisters, and then reunited, and the manuscript was reunited. It also has the world's smallest Armenian manuscript, about this size, if you can see my hand. So it's, it's comparing those two. Now, the second largest collection in the world is in Jerusalem, at the St. James Armenian Monastery in Jerusalem. Why would you suppose there would be so many manus uh, manuscripts in Jerusalem? Probably because, over the time of the last several thousand years, since Armenians have been Christian, 1,500, 1,700 years, visitors to Jerusalem would want to take gifts. They want to take gifts to the Holy Land. And so they brought gifts of manuscripts. And so today, there are more than 4,000 Armenian manuscripts in uh, Jerusalem, which are also now being cataloged. And among them is the Gospel of King Gagi Gokars, which is one of the most uh, beautiful manuscripts. That's for another day. That won't be today, but Jerusalem is an important collection. Also, the Mokhitaris congregation in San Lazaro, Venice. Uh, the Mokhitaris are a Catholic order of Armenian priests established in 1717, 1717, and they were awarded the island of San Lazaro, which is in the lagoon of Venice, and on which they have built uh, buildings where they sleep, live, eat. And you see this little round building? That's their library. That's the library up close. And then this is the collection that is being uh, held there. You can see the, the books. They have the little white tags telling you their numbers. The collection in Jerusalem is, is named J and then the number. Matena Taran is M and then 2374. And then the fourth largest collection is in the Mokhitaris Monastery of Vienna. I haven't been here, but it is the fourth largest collection of more than 2,600 manuscripts. You don't have to travel all that way to see Armenian manuscripts because here are some places you could go that maybe are closer, like UCLA. UCLA has a very nice collection of over 100 Armenian uh, manuscripts. The Getty Museum in Los Angeles also has a couple of uh, pages or folios from Armenian ma manuscripts. But the Holy See of Etchmiadzin itself still has manuscripts in their museums. Uh, the Holy See in Lebanon, in Antilias, has a collection. The Armenian Cathedral of Nujulfa in Iran has a very sizable collection. The Armenian uh, Catholic Church at Zammar in Lebanon has a very good collection of Armenian manuscripts, which I also have seen, and which fortunately have now been completely scanned. So they are now protected because if there is war, which now there is war in many places, uh, they would be in danger of being damaged, but copies are now kept in safe locations. You could also go to the British Library, the Bodleian, and other private collections uh, to see Armenian manuscripts. When I say to see, do we really know where all the private uh, collected manuscripts are? We don't, because some people are, just have kept them and we don't know about it. When I say we, people who've studied Armenian manuscripts. All right. So today, we're going to now uh, take a look at three Armenian manuscripts to illustrate my topic for today, which is the early tradition of Armenian manuscript production. And I would like to start off by saying that uh, Armenian manuscript production is influenced by its two neighbors. To the west, the Byzantine or Orthodox Church, the Christian Church, and to the south, the Syrian Christian Church. So I will express to you today how Armenian manuscripts have been influenced by those traditions, but also why they have created their own uniquely Armenian tradition as well. So uh, as we go through, we'll, we'll take a look at features which are strictly Armenian, but then also which have been borrowed perhaps from, from other traditions. Now, for instance, the Byzantine manuscript tradition is older than the Armenian tradition, right? Because there was a Greek Greek language and Greek manuscripts before Armenian manuscripts. So there's been a tradition there before the Armenians started in the fifth century. So today also I want to start with, it's a little bit more complex and uh, if you have questions afterwards I'll try to answer it for you. 
But what I've put up here is what I call the conventions of Armenian manuscript production. And conventions are rules. That is, they're standard, standard constructions of manuscripts in the order in which certain pages appear. So today, if you took five Armenian manuscripts and you looked at the order of what's inside the manuscript, it would follow this general order. Let's take a look at it. First is something called a Eusebian letter. We're going to see these in a moment. Second is a canon table. Some of my students are taking my course. They, they can nod their head and they know what we're talking about. Uh, the third is what are called narrative miniatures. These come from the Bible. That is, they are illustrating stories, parables from the Bible. Remember that most of these are Gospels, right? And then we get what are called the Life of Christ cycle, which takes unique moments in the life of Christ and organizes them in a complete set sometimes 12, sometimes 16, starting with baptism, annunciation, and then major moments in the life of Christ, usually ending with ascension or Pentecost. I'm going to explain those terms for you. And then also I put in blue here the gospel text. That part doesn't change, remember? That part's going to be the same because it's, it's a scribe. Boy, what a job that is, right? Uh, you're the scribe, you're the copier. They put a manuscript in front of you, they say, we need a new copy. You can't go down to the copier machine. You've got to sit there and you copy it. So it's a, it's a tremendous job, but it's the same text. What's different is the marginal and other illustrations that we're going to explore tonight as we take a look. And finally, number six is something called the colophon, which is a Greek word which really means memorial note. Uh, so a colophon is like telling the author, the scribe, he tells who it is. I, the priest Sarkis, copied this manuscript in the year of our Lord, 1200, but the Lord, the year of the Lord of the Armenian calendar, the Armenian calendar starts in the year one is the year 551. 551 is the year one in the Armenian church calendar. So 2023 is not 2023, it's more like 1450-something, right, <laughs> that you take a look at. That's the official calendar. And then also it tells you uh, what was happening in the world. Who was the Catholicos? Uh, were there any invasions happening? What's happening in the area that the scribe lived in? So today uh, we're going to start with one, we're going to look at three Gospels overall to illustrate the early tradition of the Armenian manuscript tradition. And we're going to start with something which is called the Etchmiadzin Gospel. It's number 2374. I just showed it to you just a moment ago, right? With the Tsutsav, in the Armenian Tsutsav, the, the catalog. Date. Very important. This manuscript was dated to 989. Manuscript is dated to 989, 10th century. But, and this is the big but, the but is that there are paintings in the manuscript which did not belong to the original manuscript, but must have been inserted at some later point, but are actually of earlier origin. There's sixth century, and I'm going to explain that story, uh, sixth century paintings in a ninth century manuscript. So those paintings actually were created earlier than the manuscript it's now found in. So let's take a look at that. First, I want to show you uh, where manuscripts are produced. Where do you produce a manuscript? In a monastery. Yeah, the, the, the writers are the priests. They're the educated class. It's, it's priests that are writing and copying and, and, and making these uh, manuscripts. The Etchmiadzin Gospel was, was created in this monastery right here that we're looking at. It's called the Monastery of Noravank. Nor, Nu, Vank Monastery, Noravank in the region of Sunik. How many of you have been there? I know that many of you have gone. Well, look, look at that, half the crowd, half of the audience has been to uh, Noralong. But did you know that it, it was the place where the Etchmiadzin Gospel was produced? It's in a very remote location. Okay, it's not so remote by car today, but imagine walking there or trying to get there from somewhere in, in Armenia. It's in a rather remote location. And this is, this is a close-up of one of the chapels of the, uh, of, the, of the monastery. So this is where the manuscript was produced. We start with the cover or what is called the binding of the manuscript. So I'm going to ask you questions as well. If you want, you can raise your hand and answer, but it's kind of like the question and answer uh, period in my classroom. 
where usually my students don't say anything, so I call them by name and tell them to answer something. Um, so let's focus on, the, on this cover. It's made of ivory. It's made of elephant tusk. It's made from ivory. And interestingly enough, it is also a 6th century binding. So it is not the original binding for the Etchmiadzin Gospel. It's not the original binding. It was added again later. Okay, so can anyone make out the central figure here? Some of you that are taking my class don't answer because you know. But um, if some of you others, yes, not you, Isabella. You, you're in your class, so you can't do it. Uh, can you identify who that person is, that figure? Mary, right. So that's Mary holding uh, Jesus. And the entire top binding is thematically based on the life of Mary. So if you look at the panels, you see different panels. That's the adoration of the Magi, the, the, the wise men, the Magi bringing the gifts to Mary on the bottom. Here she's on the donkey with Joseph when they're fleeing Bethlehem, right? They're going to Egypt before they come back. This is carved in a style which is called classicizing, which means it belongs to the tradition of the Byzantines. Remember I said about borrowing? Because it's a very lifelike carving, very realistic, but made entirely of ivory, which is an interesting part of this whole manuscript. Now today, then, we're going to go into the list. Yes? The cross, can you go back? The cross is interesting. Yes. Yes. Uh, it has more to do with the period of time. So when you see earlier depictions of crosses in all manuscripts, not just Armenian, they typically do not have what we today consider to be the longer arm and the shorter. We, what we typically see, as he's mentioning, is that the arms are the same distance, they're equidistant, same length and size. And this is typical of early Armenian, but other manuscripts as well. All right, so let's start with uh, some explanations. So I'm going to explain things, and then I'm going to show you it, and then uh, you'll see the connection. The first part of a manuscript is called the Eusebian letter. You can read it. It says, an explanation of the index canon table for the Gospels composed by a certain Christian bishop by the name of Eusebius, a real Christian figure, uh, who in the 4th century uh, wrote a letter to his friend Bishop Carpianus explaining to him how do you read the Bible, how do you find things in the Gospel. So let's say I wanted to find the story of the Gospel of the Baptism of Christ. Where do I go? Like which page is it on? So we're going to see that there's a table which helps the reader do that, and this Eusebian letter explains that table. It'll make sense when you see it. Um, now, Bishop Eusebius was also commissioned, he's Greek, remember, he's Byzantine, he was a commission to create 50 Gospels in the 4th century. This is an important point, because none have survived. But the argument is that the early Armenian manuscripts follow the pattern of the early Byzantine. That's the whole point that I'm making with you uh, on this one. And they perhaps served as models for Armenian. So here's the first painting from the Etchmiadzin Gospel. And this is what we call a Eusebian letter. So take a, mo take a look at it for a moment. And uh, so we're going to talk about two things. One is the iconography. The word iconography means what's in the painting. And then we're going to talk about the style. But I want to have the audience uh, interact with me today. So looking at this, let's start with style. What, what strikes you about the style, the colors, uh, the way things are depicted? You can raise your hand. Not people in my class. Not, you, don't, you don't get to, because you already, you already know things that we've learned. So other people. What do you notice about the colors? Let's start with the colors. What do you, what, right. Isabella, please, uh, you can hold on, OK? Let other people answer. What are, we, what are we looking at with the colors? This is a manuscript that's what, a 1,000 years old? And yet it embodies very bright, vivid colors. Armenians favored very saturated colors coming from minerals. Minerals are stone, rock, not organic. They used organic, but it's more mineral. And so in this, you see decorated uh, a typical arch with pillars framing the Eusebian letter. It looks like a letter. That's all Armenian. This is typical in every single Armenian manuscript. They all have Eusebian letters. It's a letter telling you how to use the next page, which we'll see in just a moment. 
But we also see something interesting, pomegranate trees. Pomegranate trees represent eternal life. They uh, represent uh, prosperity. So they are often used in Armenian manuscript tradition, as well as in Byzantine tradition. We also see typical birds, and also just a very uh, decorated area, space, and very decorated pillars. That's intended to be marble. Looks like it, doesn't it? Marble pillars. And then look at the capitals, the top parts. And this is a very, very much in the model of the Byzantines. So let's talk about style. The style is what is called classicizing. The intent is to be realistic and much like real life. So this is the Armenian way of painting or decorating. So when we talk about Armenian painting, this is what we're talking about. Well, now let's go to, yes. Why birds? Why birds? So birds, birds. Who can tell me about the birds? The birds represent various types of uh, virtues. So there's an ancient Greek uh, book called the Physiologus. Do you think about what we associate with animals today? The lion is? Great. The fox is? The turtle is, or the hare is. You know, all of these things we have associations. Where did they come from? The Physiologus was a Greek book which gave characteristics to birds and other animals and the Armenians adopted these we see them all the time in Armenian manuscript illumination so there's lots of birds and tonight we're going to see one that you will never expect ever to see in, a, in an Armenian manuscript coming up very shortly let's go to the second page the canon table so it looks like a table doesn't it tables so if I want to find the baptism of Christ in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where would I go? I would go here, and it explains which page it's on, and it's a concordance. So it makes it easy for the reader to find those different parts. And there are typically not just one page, but ten. Ten folios, ten pages to cover the entire Gospels. You notice it has similar decoration. You can see it's the same artist, can't you? Same artist with the... Uh, pillars, and then also with the birds and the other types of decorations. So the Etchmiadzin Gospel, this is the 989 Gospel, right? We're looking at not the 6th century. This is the 989 Gospel that we're looking at. And then we get to some of the narrative miniatures. This is where it really becomes fascinating. Because every painting is a choice. The artist must choose. They can't make 100 paintings. They have to choose what they want to do. So it should ask you, you should be asking yourself, why would an Armenian gospel contain a painting of the sacrifice of Abraham and Isaac? What's the theology behind it? What's the exegesis, the interpretation of the biblical passage that would make the Armenian authors want to include this in a manuscript before the gospels came about? Bogbelly could answer maybe. I yeah. put you on the spot, but yeah. yeah. Well, Abraham was supposed to sacrifice Isaac, but God rescued him. There's God, everyone. Look, there's God represented with a hand. Yes, Rescue. that's God. God rescued him. Yes. For the New Testament, God did not rescue His Son who died on the cross. Okay. So I'm assuming they, they chose from Old Testament that passage because it goes really well with the New Testament. That's right. Where so there's many interpretations. Of course, Abraham plays a pivotal role in the entire Old Testament because he forms the covenant with God, right? Uh, he, he promised to kill his own son. God said, you should do that. And he did. He was going to do it. Look, he's ready to take the sword to his son. But then God said, stop. And then he's the covenant. And then from, from there on. Now, the Armenian parts to this. This is, the, it, this is the sacrifice area where they sacrifice the animals. But look at the fire. Look how bright it is. That's a, that's a reflection of the Armenian Zoroastrian religion from the old times where they had fire temples. And so in the Christian context, this is now Christian, but they, they make that kind of very prominent here. Uh, and again, the hand of God. Uh, it's not showing God, right? We don't depict God usually in Armenian art. But there is a representation which is done in, in, in this way. So this is also a narrative miniature in the Etchmiadzin Gospel. 
And then this one, which I like a lot. It's called, in uh, the name of it, that we would name it, is Mary in the Orans and the Baby Jesus. Not really a baby here, is he? A little <laughs> bit older. I called him baby, but it's a, it's a young Jesus, clearly. Mary has her hands outstretched up towards heaven. This is a standard, classicizing, Byzantine pose of Mary. When Mary is doing that, she is praising God. This is where it comes from. And it comes from other Byzantine manuscripts which are similar. And that is called in Latin or Greek, Oran. A fixed pose of Mary adopted from earlier Greek manuscripts, but this is an extremely lavish painting, isn't it? Look at the decoration of her couch. Look at the clothing that she's wearing. She's wearing very lifelike clothing, three-dimensional, because it's a very, uh, good artist who's doing this. In a moment, we're going to see artists that are not so well trained, perhaps. Uh, you also see the very nice border uh, as well in this. Now, I'm going through these a little bit quickly, but if you have questions at the end, we'll come back and, and take a look at them. Now, these are the narrative miniatures. Now, the interesting part in the Eshmiazin Gospel is that uh, when a couple of scholars were studying this manuscript, and the first person was not this person, but Joseph Strugowski, when he was studying the Armenian manuscript, he noticed something. He said, some of the paintings don't match with the other paintings. The style doesn't fit, not the same artist. And they came to the conclusion that four of the paintings now inserted into the manuscript are not original 989, but rather are from the 6th century. Later, in the 20th century, the most famous, perhaps, Armenian art historian is a woman called Sirarpi Dernersesian. Here she is. 1896 to 1989, lived a very long life. She is the dean of the most important Armenian art historian of the 20th century. Her uncle was uh, Malakia Sirpazan Ormanyan, the patriarch of uh, Istanbul. She's from a very important Armenian family. But she was the one that established definitively that the next four paintings that we're going to look at are not 9th, 10th century, they are rather from the 6th century. And this is uh, turned, you know, this upside down because it's the oldest and earliest Armenian manuscript paintings, the 6th century. And so we're going to take a look at those now. There are four paintings, here they are. And in order, and I'm going to go through it uh, rather quickly, but uh, I'll show it to you as we uh, go along. The first one is called The Annunciation of the Angel Gabriel to Zechariah. On the left, you have the angel. Looks like an angel because there's something that really tells you it's an angel. What is it? Wings. wings. Yeah, wings and a halo. Good. Wings and a halo. Now, again, everybody but Isabella. Isabella, don't answer the question. But taking a look at the wings, can you tell me what, what's decoratively interesting about the wings? Peacock. Why peacocks? Why peacocks feathers? So... There are, there are, there are uh, interpretations of these paintings by Armenian bishops over the centuries. Peacocks are, of course, the beautiful birds, aren't they? Yes. One theory is that the peacock feathers illustrate the rank of this angel. This is the archangel Gabriel. He must have the most beautiful wings because they are the wings of the peacock here. So this is very interesting, and it's only found really in Armenian art. So this is a, a unique to Armenian art. On the right, we have someone dressed in the clothing of a high priest. Uh, Zachariah is the father of John the Baptist. The father of John the Baptist. So what's the angel telling him? He's announcing Annunciation. You are the future father of St. John the Baptist. Why? Look, look, at, look at Zachariah. Was he a young man? Older man, who's his wife? What's the name of uh, Zachariah's wife? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. They were both older and could not have children. And suddenly an angel comes miraculously and announces to them, you're going to have a child, which will be the future John the Baptist. So the style of this painting does not match the earlier paintings we looked at. And Sirapri Dernersesian, based on comparing, comparing it with other traditions, puts it to the late 6th century and early 7th century before the year 640,
because after 640, Armenia was invaded by Arabs and the Arab Empire. The Arabs eventually conquered Armenia. And so manuscript tradition stopped in that way. So this is the earliest paintings in Armenian tradition, the early tradition, Annunciation of the Angel Gabriel to Zechariah. A second painting, another Annunciation. Easily see that it looks pretty much like our Gabriel here, doesn't it? Now, let's talk about Mary. Let's talk about the way that she's portrayed. In other words, if you look at her face, what expression does she have in the painting? What did the artist give us the impression that she's doing? You can raise your hand if you maybe have an answer. Raise your hand if you think, yes. She was perhaps uh, concerned or maybe confused. Concerned, confused, very good. What else? Sad. Sad? What else? What's happening here? You, you know what's happening, right? An angel has come to you. Now, first of all, if I saw an angel in front of me, that would be pretty shocking, right? Yeah, and then the angel's telling me that I'm going to have a baby telling the Mary that she's a woman that's not married yet. Yes. That she's going to have a baby. I would be pretty shocked, right? So there's a there's kind of a perplexed look, right? The hand on the chin is kind of our, our way we kind of are perplexed sometimes, right? So she's being portrayed in a very realistic way because that also is in the Bible. Now, what was she doing when she uh, was... Does anyone know what she was doing when uh, the angel announced... Sleeping? Uh, well, no, this is the moment that, that it's over here. What, what is she holding? It's really hard to see. No, right over here. She was knitting. She had her knitting with her. Knitting is a symbol of a woman who is at home but doing something productive, and it was typical of noble families. So Mary is being depicted as a, a noble woman, of course, the Mary, the mother of God. And if you look at the style as we've talked about it, all of this is done in the 6th century classicizing Greek style. But yet, what's included? Always Armenian elements, things that are not in other Byzantine uh, manuscripts. She's spinning wool here, and she actually kind of drops it, can you imagine? Because again, she's shocked at, at the news that she is having. Now, let's go back for a moment. What I want you to keep in the back of your mind that these four paintings are one story. We're going to have to figure out what the story is, why these four paintings are one story. So remember how it starts? Annunciation, Annunciation. Then where is it going to jump? The birth of Christ. So there's Jesus, Mary. And we have what in Western tradition are called wise men or kings. But I'd like you to draw your attention down here to one, two, and three. One, two, and three. There's Gabriel peeking out behind the throne. That's, that's Gabriel right here. Now, these three men are the Magi. Uh, how are they dressed? Well, they're dressed in the clothing and the manner of Zoroastrian priests called Magi. For the Armenians then, the, the, Armenian, the, the people bringing the gifts are not Western kings. They are members of the religion that Armenia was, showing their what? Submission to the new king, to the new religion, which is Jesus. And you see their, their feet are, their heels are together? That is standard Persian uh, art iconography. In other words, you go to Persian art, you see them doing the same thing. What are they also wearing? They're wearing beautiful clothing and even jewelry. They have uh, pearl earrings. Very high class people because they're high, high members of the royalty. It also illustrates the three ages of man. There's a very young magi, a middle-aged magi, and this one's a little bit older magi as well. Now, the one thing to hear that I want to just point out, there's many things to talk about. Let's look at Jesus, everyone. Now, Mary is holding Jesus, but is that how you would hold a child? Kind of on the top of their head and you know underneath, like just holding him like that? Uh, what do we see here? Some blue light, right? In art, that is the word mandorla. Mandorla is an aura of blue light, which symbolizes divinity. But it's not a uniquely Armenian form. It comes from Buddhism. Wait a minute. Armenians were in contact with Buddhists from 
you know, Asia, India, and Asia, and included some of that art in the sixth century, and that's what the theory is, because it appears in Buddhist art from the sixth century. The Buddhist art here is that this mandorla is a holy, a holy aura of light, which even Mary, the mother of God, cannot touch her son, the son of God, because he is so sacred. And that is an Armenian interpretation, an Armenian exegesis, an interpretation of the significance of Mary and, and the baby Jesus. So in Armenian tradition, there's no three kings, it's three magi. And again, uh, the beautiful, this is a full page folio, by the way, right? A big page, all painted. And again, the vibrant colors that we talked about. And the final one, I think you'll like this one, is really interesting. Uh, it's the baptism of Christ. So the baptism is the final of the four paintings. And so, but baptism, John, who was announced in scene one, painting one. On the right, Jesus, young man, River Jordan, hand of God, dove, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit depicted in this in this manuscript. Now, this painting. Now the baptism, let's let's look at the meaning behind it. Why did they choose to end this in baptism? When do the Armenians celebrate the baptism of Christ? What what day and what part of the year? Who can tell me? When do they celebrate the baptism? Uh, actually earlier in, in the Armenian tradition too, in the Orthodox tradition I would say. Well, when is the Armenian Christmas? Six. 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 Seven. January 6th is Armenian Christmas. We say Armenian Christmas. That's celebrating the birth, one. Secondly, it's celebrating the baptism of Christ. Because what takes place on that day, the ceremony? Blessing of water. Baptism. But there's a third element, which is what? Who can tell me? What's the third part of this Armenian church painting. The revelation of Christ as the Son of God. The epiphany. How is that shown here? What did God say in the Bible when he, when the dove came down? A voice came from heaven and said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Beloved Son. Beloved son. Mm -hmm. So he's what? Telling the world, that's my Son. That's God. And so the painting, really that's completing that. Now, do you remember I said to you there's paintings and then after the paintings come the portrait, I mentioned it very quickly, of evangelists. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do you see them on the painting? Yeah, yeah they're, the, they're the, in the corner, just their heads. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But now, something that is very unusual and only uniquely Armenian. These decorations in these little round areas. This is one, this is another, and it's repeated. So I'm going to open it again, again, not to our students that are taking the class, because we just <laughs> finished talking about it. I gave them a test, and so some of so, so them know what it is. Anyone? So look at this one. I think it's easiest to see here. What is this item thing? It's a chalice. It's a chalice. A chalice for communion. Good. Now let's go to the next part. What's this? It's hard to make out, but that's wings? A bird. A bird. <laughs> What's a bird doing in a chalice that's used for communion? Holy Spirit. Close. You have to know what kind of a bird it is. A dove. No, it's not a dove. It's a bird that is actually, you could not see it very well, I agree, because there's a lot of light. That bird is pecking at its breast its chest, it is going to feed its chicks. There's no food, so what is it going to do? It's going to break open its own chest, and the blood, uh, its blood is going to feed those chicks. Blood. Christ, right? Which bird is it? It's a real bird in, that really does that. Pelican. That is a pelican. And the pelican, again, back to our birds and physiologus and what what characteristics do birds have? The pelican is a self-sacrificing mother that will mangle its own chest to get blood to give to its own 
chicks if they don't have any food. Which is what then? Isn't that communion? Yes. That Jesus sacrificed himself for his people? And so here we see it in the Armenian exegesis. We don't see it in any, any other place. So an Armenian interpretation ending with the four of the final four miniatures. Okay? So, Etchmiadzin Gospel, earliest painting, 6th century, 10th century, other parts that we're, we're looking at. Now let's move on. Uh, this is simply, I just put this here, but that's the pa one passage which tells you about, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now let's uh, also talk about uh, the idea again of dogmatic belief. That the painting is not simply somebody just painting something. They have something they want to get across to you. And what they want to get across to you is how the Armenian church looks at these events. And so again, I mentioned it to you already. Uh, Thomas Matthews, who's a well-known Armenian, uh, a well-known art historian studying Armenian manuscripts, says the four miniatures together are a complete cycle representing the epiphany of Christ, birth, baptism, and revelation. So late 6th to 7th century, the earliest Armenian paintings in Armenian manuscript history. Let's move on. Covers we talked about, top cover Mary. How about the bottom? I've already got it for you, Life of Christ, that's Jesus. Panels indicate various moments in the life of Christ. That's the Etchmiadzin Gospel. Today we're going to now look at our second Gospel. We're only going to look at three today. This is called the Queen Mulke Gospel. Queen Mulke was a 10th century Armenian queen. She was the wife of King Gagik of Arts, uh, Artsurmi, of Basvodagi. But look at the date of the manuscript, 851 to 862. It's actually before she was ever born. She, she acquired it later. But the date of this manuscript we're now going to look at is 851-862, so it's even older than the Etchmiadzin main gospel, right? Ninth century. Eusebian letter, we, we've already learned that, right? But now look at the Armenian part to it. If you look over here, there's some painting, and I'm going to show it to you closer. So this is a close-up. We know what that is, that's the letter, but what about this part? What do you see? Crocodiles, alligators. What do you mean? In Linda, are there crocodiles in Armenia? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Where, where are they around in the U.S.? Florida. Only really Florida in a kind of a tropic environment. Is Armenia tropic? No, it's not tropic. What else do you see? Fish. Fish. Boats. Men in boats fishing. Well, what does that have to do with a Christian gospel or Christian painting? It's a space, this space is a place where the artist could, could elaborate their own artistic ideas. Because the idea here, which I didn't mention to you, and I'm going to show it to you again in a moment, is that these are very beautiful paintings, are they not? And they actually usher us into the study of the Gospels, because what we're doing is getting prepared to see something, read something beautiful, which is the Word of God. This is a scene from the Nile River. The Nile River has alligators and fish, and, and that's where these fishermen are. It's nothing to do with Armenia, but the artist must have been aware of that to bring that into this, into this painting. Uniquely Armenian. Cannon tables. That's pretty standard, but look at the painting again over here. What do you see? Looks like sea animals, sea creatures, right? I see an octopus, eight, eight leg, and other kinds of fish. Is that not continuing the theme that we saw earlier? And all of the cannon tables are decorated with the same same style of uh, of artistic work. Marlo? Yes. Because disciples were fishermen. Anything to do with that? Because Could be. And I don't know. I haven't. I, Right, it could be, but generally speaking, we see things that are that are so anomalous, meaning so outside the Christian story. And I'll show you one. I think we we have uh, fabulous animals, animals that are not real animals, but fabulous animals, yeah. plants that are you know different. So possible. There's nothing that I'm leaving out of it, but it's possible that that's the interpretation. 
All right, Queen Mulke Gospel has only one painting that survived. That's this. Only one painting that has survived. And I give you the name of it, which is Ascension of Christ. So what, what we know is that it must be missing a lot of paintings, right? Because the Ascension is way down the line, isn't it? Baptism, crucifixion, uh, resurrection, Ascension. Only surviving painting of the Queen Mulke Gospel. Let's look at it and analyze the iconography. So what do we see in the bottom? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All painted in different looks, like, you know, they're different families, different people. And in the center? Mary. Mary and the Orans. And they all have their attention fixed on Jesus, who is being carried into heaven. This is the 40th day after Easter. Ascension marks the 40th day after Easter. So this holiday here is, is shown in this painting. But I want to show you a close-up to really give you the idea of miniatures. We're going to take a close-up of Jesus. Can you see the detail in that face? And in the details of the angels? These are very stern angels, aren't they? They're like guardian angels. They're protecting Christ. These angels are kind of carrying him, but they're not touching him. And he's still in a mandorla, isn't he? The mandorla of light. So his face is probably the size of maybe this real small, right? So the, the artist is showing their talent in this miniature painting by showing us how well they're doing. And again, the colors are very vibrant colors even after a thousand years because they're mineral colors. Colors which are bright mineral colors, they don't fade over time. And Armenians favored uh, these brighter colors. Now, the ascension of Christ and the entire Queen Mulke Gospel is in the same style as the Etchmiazin called classicizing, which means it borrowed also in its iconography from the Byzantines. But I want to show you something quite interesting. You have to always compare Armenian art with its surroundings. So let's take a look at. Uh, this is just the, the wording of it. We'll come back to it. Oh, let me do the portraits first. So these are portraits of the four evangelists. This is St. Luke, or St. Mark, obviously, classicizing style. It's got the words. This is the actual inscription in here in the, in the bottom of it. Very beautifully illustrated, is it not? With clamshells, scallops, you might call them. Uh, he's sitting, and what does he have? He's got the, he's got the very manuscript he's writing. So he's producing his own manuscript. Also, uh, St. Luke. And then look at this. This is St. Matthew close up, but look at the face. That's classicizing style when it's very realistic. It looks like a real person. It's painted. The person who's done it has been trained to be a painter. Uh, I couldn't paint like that. Probably, you know, if you have never painted, you can't do something like that. But if you've been trained, you're able to do so. Okay, so now comparison, everyone. Think of what we just saw in the Queen Mulke Gospel. We're now looking at a 6th century manuscript, Syrian. It's called the Rabula Gospel. Rabula Gospel. And you can tell me what page we're looking at. The, the, the tables, what did we call it? Canon. Canon table index. Okay. And then some paintings. You say, okay, that's great. So what? But now look at this painting, also from the Rabula Gospel. So does it resemble anything we just saw? Very much. Very much in the same iconography. Which one is earlier? This is 6th century. Queen Mulke is 9th century. This is already a standard image of Jesus and Mary, but Jesus going up into heaven. But stylistically, it's different, isn't it? Look at the colors. What would you say? More muted? Mm -hmm. Pastel? Mm -hmm. This is typical Byzantine Syrian paint, painting style. Not the vivid images that we see in the Armenian. Uh, basically the same, though, right? Six on each side, Mary in the Oran. Jesus being carried, yes, the angels are slightly different. But the Rabula Gospel illustrates that Armenian, Armenian artists were in we're in communication with their neighbors. You understand the word communication in that sense? That they were aware of other people's work. 
that gave them ideas that they then incorporated in an Armenian manuscript and also put an Armenian stamp on it. It's not just blind copying, right? It's not, it's not just copying exactly what I saw. But it's incorporating that into an artistic tradition. You had a question? Yeah, um, I, I was curious. So that's angels carrying the right? Yeah, these are angels up uh, here. Yeah, well, this is a chariot, actually, here. This is a chariot. But these are angels here. So let's go back over here. And you see that here it's four angels, really two angels carrying him and two guardian angels standing on, on each side, right? That are protecting him. Okay? So I showed you the, the, the Rabula Gospel because I wanted to show you the comparison that Armenian art was in communion in the early tradition with both Syrian and Byzantine uh, art. Now let's look at the final gospel and we'll conclude and then if you have questions we can, we can open it up. The third manuscript we're going to look at is a manuscript called the Translator's Gospel. It's actually found in the United States, in Baltimore, in a place called the Walters Gallery. Some of you have been there. The Walters Gallery is a well-known gallery which contains paintings, but also uh, ancient art, including this manuscript. The manuscript is 10th century, 9th, 10th century, right? 966. The scribe, the person who copied it, is Sarkis the priest. But it's going to be an entirely different style than what we saw in our first two manuscripts, which were the classicizing or the Byzantine style that we looked at. So everybody have it? 966. It's not that far from the other one, right? Maybe 100 years later? So take a look at what you have here. And then we'll open it up again to, to questions. What do you see? What's, what, who's in the painting? What, what are they doing? Uh, what's the rest of the decoration like? Is that classicizing? Does it look uh, realistic? Does it look uh, three-dimensional like someone really was doing it? Or does it look a little different? Quite a bit different, right? Let's start with the figures. Identify the figures. Who are they? Mary and Jesus. But do you remember what we saw Mary and Jesus uh, in, in the Etchmazin Gospel, right? The very beautiful painting. So what's happened here? The artist is making a painting with very simple brush strokes. They're not trained. Look at Mary's face. It's just a couple of eyebrows, you know, a couple of strokes for her eyebrows. Uh, this is interesting. Look at Jesus. I call him the little Frankenstein here because, because you, see some, you see some little knobs coming out of his head. That's a cross which is inscribed in a halo. The halo you don't see anymore, but... He was Jesus because he has a halo with a cross. You can't see the, the cross. So that's part of the iconography of this, of this painting. This is Mary in the Orans again. But look at her arms. That's a pretty awkward, awkward position, isn't it? Like, I don't know, can't really do that. And then uh, look at Jesus in his little hands. He's holding uh, a gospel. What about the colors? Well, the entire manuscript backing is not painted. Uh, which is also this style. So this is a new style in Armenian art, when I call new style, it's a different pathway. It's a more provincial or monastic style, a simpler style, not the, not the classicizing style that we're used to. So it's called monastic provincial style, a manuscript painting. It's the oldest one in that style that we have, 10th century. So the earlier ones are all classicizing, but 10th century, unaffected by Byzantine or Syrian techniques. So remember the other ones had things they borrowed? This is a priest who's in an isolated area. He's painting whatever he knows, and he's not in communion with the Byzantines and with the, with the Syrians. But this is some oriental colors in that one, though. Uh, when you say oriental, you have to be careful what you're saying. Oriental meaning Eastern, you're saying, or uh, something else. We'll come back to it. Let's wait till the uh, questions, but we'll come to it. Now, do you remember the priest we just saw? Uh, excuse me, the evangelist? Dressed in the robes of philosophers, very nice togas with very nice halos. Take a look at these priests. Excuse me, these evangelists, what are they dressed in? They're dressed in the clothing of Armenian priests. They are given beards, they are wearing caps, and they're wearing a cloak and very colorful vestments like an Armenian Orthodox priest would wear. And their feet are kind of awkward because, because the artist doesn't really know how to portray that three-dimensionally. 
We also see the birds again in this, in this area. These are the evangelists, Mark and Luke. How do we know? Because it says Margos and Hugos. You can read Armenian, you can, you can read it. This manuscript is a completely different style. It represents a style which in the 11th century will become very common. And then the close-up. Look at the odd, odd style of his hands, right? But he's holding his own gospel. And he's holding his own gospel because he's going to make a gift. He's dedicating it to, to God. He's wearing a, a cloak, and again, the feet. But look at the face, just a couple of brush strokes. Traditionally, Armenian priests should have beards. Now, some don't nowadays, but traditionally, Armenian priests must have beards. And that's what they, what they have here, and the cap uh, as well. So these paintings illustrate the monastic provincial style. We're almost at the end here. So uh, this reflects... In our early tradition, then, we have two distinct styles, right? The one which is this classicizing, more Byzantine Syrian, and then we have the more native style, which is a more Armenian style, we can call it. And we have at least uh, 18 illuminated manuscripts from this period of 11th century, where we begin to see more of each of them. Today is not the day to go into it. We could look at many from each of the traditions that we're, we're looking at. So, after the 11th century is a very productive period in Armenian manuscript painting. Uh, unfortunately, we only have surviving, we only have surviving some uh, 25,000 manuscripts. We can only imagine that there were tens of thousands that have been lost through invasions, burning, you know, just destruction. But fortunately, we have the ones that we have, and that gives us a look into the early tradition of the Armenians in manuscript painting. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes uh, for questions, and then afterwards we'll have some coffee, and then you'll have a chance to actually uh, take a look at some of the books. So I'll, I'll entertain some questions by.